Good evening and welcome to the Bible study, midweek Bible study for the Church of Christ that meets on Miami Gardens Drive. I'm Brother Gail Nelson. I'll be teaching tonight and we're thankful on behalf of the elders and deacons and the saints at Miami Gardens. Thank you for being with us tonight. We hope, trust, and pray that everyone has had a pleasant day. And down here in South Florida, it's been raining. I'm glad we preached that lesson and studied the word. 40 days and 40 nights is not an option. We've had, I think, about four straight days and people are tired of the rain, but let's be thankful. Don't complain about the rain. Don't complain about the cold weather. Thank God for yet another day. Let us pray. Gracious Heavenly Father, we are thankful for yet another day. We thank you for the sunshine and the rain. We thank you for life, health, and strength. It is our fervent prayer tonight that as the word of God is taught, that we'll be mindful of who we are and whose we are, and that we do all things necessary to stand acceptably, reverently, and faithfully before thee, so we can make heaven our home. Be with all those that are with us tonight, both near and far. Be with those that are visiting with us as well. We pray that they will hear something tonight that will convict their soul, convict their mind, their heart, so that their soul can be saved and obey through obedience of the gospel. Thank you for this opportunity to yet again teach your word. May we do it without addition or subtraction. In Jesus' name, amen. Tonight is part one of a two-part lesson. Certainly, I won't be able to finish it tonight. You'll see why shortly. I have Ephesians 6, 10 through 17. Technically, we're going to go 10 through 20 once we get through the full lesson. Uh, we're going to just kick it off tonight. The armor of God. The armor of God. And tonight, our journey begins by going through a few things. One, we'll take a look at the power of situational leadership through Paul's environment. We'll explain that. We will look at the reality of the fight. We're in a fight, call it what it is. We'll look at the mindset of a Christian soldier, stand, stand. And we will also look at the armament of a Christian soldier, a word panoply. By the conclusion of this lesson, everybody will know what panoply means. You will use it, uh, I hope you use it. And not only, not, not that you get on the bus or something tomorrow and say, do you know what panoply means? I don't mean it that way but I hope you understand it and apply it to your life. The panoply, we have a song we sing, the panoply of God is part of one of the lyrics and one of the verses, you'll know what that means. So let's jump into it, let's go to work. In Ephesians chapter six, beginning at verse 10, Paul writing to the church of Christ at Ephesus. Paul says, finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. Put on the whole, armor of God that he may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. Paul goes on to say, for we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. Wherefore, take unto you the whole armor of God that ye may be, that ye may be able to withstand in the evil day and having done all, having done all to stand. Stand therefore having your loins, loins girt about with truth, having on the breastplate of righteousness and your feet shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace. So as Paul uh, stresses what's taking place, you know, here in Ephesians chapter six, I want to make sure you all have some context on what Paul, where Paul was and the power of situational leadership. When I think about situational leadership uh, and to make sure everybody understands what that is, I don't want to insult your intelligence, but see, Paul at the time was a prisoner in Rome. Paul was a prisoner in Rome when he wrote this, this letter, this epistle to the church at Ephesus. He spent much of his time in the presence of Roman guards. So what did Paul see day in and day out? Roman guards in their full armor. So he used the image of a Roman soldier's armor to describe the Christian's armament. So I've given you that contextually so that we can understand situational leadership. It means just what it says. You, based on your situation, your environment, how do you respond? How do you respond? Uh, I'll give you a little psychology just to break this down, but uh, you know, behavior is a function of the person and the environment. Let me say that again. I may put that in the chat. 
Behavior is a function of the person and the environment. If it's hot outside, what do you do? You may get some water. You may uh, have a fan. Your behavior is a direct re is a is a result of who you are, how you respond, and the environment. I had a meeting today, and did my presentation. Everybody was good. Then I had one of my team members do a presentation, and the response was a little. They they kind of they kept asking him questions, and he panicked. And then another team member panicked. And after that meeting, I said, I want everybody on the phone. And I said, when you all see me panic, then you panic. And what's my point? Brothers and sisters, Jesus didn't panic. We as children of God, just no matter what's going on in this world, do not need to panic. Panic by definition, to lose control to the point where you just, you may say or do anything based on fear. Behavior is a function of the person and the, situ and their, and the situation. So Paul was a situational leader. Paul was in prison, but yet Paul used the environment. He didn't complain, but Paul encouraged children of God. Paul is encouraging us tonight through the written word. And he was in prison seeing Roman soldiers and said, aha, I'll use their armament to encourage my brothers and sisters on how we should be equipped and the mindset we should have. Amen, saints. So what did Paul see? He's in prison. And a Roman soldier, I want you all to understand, a Roman soldier didn't just put on a, a, a cap, a felt cap, uh, and some camouflage felt clothing. A Roman soldier, just to be clear, was in full armament. Take a close look at that now. From the helmet to the, to the feet, that were shod with those, uh, what would they kind of call like sandal boots, if you will. But we're gonna take a look. And so as we go through this lesson, it's important for you to understand, Paul sees this every day in prison. Yet Paul says, I will use this imagery. I will use this to encourage my brothers and sisters in Christ. So now what do you see? And how are you using it to encourage, not only for you to stay encouraged, but for you to inform others as well. When you turn on the TV, your first question tonight, go to the chat. Engineers, open the chat. What do you see? And don't just tell, I don't want to tell me about it. Now. I see a plan on TV and no, no. What do you see when you turn on the TV? Right, if you don't turn on the TV, what do you see? Give me one image that you see regularly, whatever it is. It may be traffic in Miami. It may be, just give me one image, anything. Just, I want you to think a little bit. Paul used what he saw. And some people may say, I turn on the TV or I hear the radio, I'm hearing death, I'm hearing this. What do you see or hear, since we're in a more technological age, what do you see or hear every day? Put it in a word or two. Go to the chat. Let's go. What do you see or hear every day? Talking about situational leadership. I need you all to help me now. Go to the chat. Let me see what we have here. Trump, <laughs> Trump mishaps, anxiety and fear. Thank you. Arguing. As of the last few days, rain. All right. Come on now, chaos, sports-related topics. I like this, calamity, division, election. There you go, situational. Uh, thank you, Lisa, election race polls and probably getting phone calls and seeing uh, you know, two different, all these commercials. He's a liar, no, she's a liar. Now you vote for this one, the world gonna come to win. Worldwide corruption, thank you. I'll give it a couple more seconds, uh, cause I'm loving this. Jeanette, happy ending in the Western. So thank you, Jeanette, for the gun smoke uh, illustration. Uh, anger, death, hate, confusion. Thank you all for just giving some feedback, you know, on that as well. And so from everything from somebody watching sports to the Westerns to arguments, anxiety, fear, uh, politicians uh, who uh, portray themselves as almost as if they are a king, division. So a lot of hate, confusion, division. So how can we as Christians, let me flip the script on you now. With, for those, whatever, whoever participated, and thank you for doing so, but how do we use that as Christians? How do we use that as Christians? And I will take everything, and, and again, I don't know what you all are going to put in the, in the chat. Let me go to it again. And if I were just to do a kind of a real-time uh, coaching session, uh, I'm going to call the name just to give reference to whoever put it in. It's like Sister Rosalind, you see a politician with his mishaps. 
So don't put your trust in man. That's a conversation you can have with somebody because some people are going crazy. Anxiety and fear, tequila, thank you for that. God has not given us a spirit of fear, but a power and love of a sound mind. So when we see people that are just so anxious and fearful, it's an opportunity for us to evangelize. Beverly arguing. So we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities and powers. So we got opportunities to help people recognize it's, it's really not worth it. You can win an argument, but lose your soul. Tyrone, the rain we talked about. Thank God it's not going to rain 40 days and 40 nights. We got scripture for that. And there's a rainbow in the cloud. Talk about the promises of God. Andrea, thank you. Chaos. God is not the, given, is not the author of confusion, but of peace and love and of a sound mind. So God's not the author of confusion, but of peace. Sports-related topics in the game of life, Tony. Everybody makes a team, but how you play is up to you. So in other words, when we talk about the team, get on God's team. Calamity, division. I'm going to go through all of these very quickly. Calamity, division. In other words, you know, the Lewis family and Tasha. You don't see uh, 1 Corinthians 1 and verse number 10. You know, again, uh, we should not be divided. Let us all speak the same thing. A good opportunity to share that with somebody. Calamity or confusion, Lewis family. Same thing. God is not the author of confusion. All the stuff we're dealing with. Uh, and of course, election. Make your calling an election sure. That was a kind of a spontaneous, real time opportunity for us to turn uh, the lemons into lemonade, if you will. So Paul saw this. Thank you all. Paul saw this. He saw a Roman soldier and he says, let me encourage my brothers and sisters on the reality of the fight. Why did a Roman soldier dress that way? Preparing for battle at any time. That was their equipment. That was their armor. And so the reality, we are in a fight, brothers and sisters. Paul told his son in the faith, Timothy, fight the good fight of faith. He didn't say just any fight because not all fighting is good. And some of y'all can't fight. I was in a training session for uh, in, in talking about how to uh, handle an active shooter. Police department did the training and they said it's important uh, that you know how people respond in the midst of a fight, in the midst of chaos, calamity. And he said, raise your hand if you're willing to take somebody down. Some people raise their hand. He said, for those who didn't raise your hand, please tell me how you would respond. One lady raised her hand, I would scream. I'm like, well, she probably gonna get shot. Because he said, you gotta be quiet. If somebody is active shooters walking around and you screaming, he probably gonna shoot you. I don't, I'm not promoting violence, but he said, no, you gotta make sure somebody's gotta be with her and to cover her mouth. Because you gotta run, hide and fight, not scream and hope you don't get shot. That's not the way the training works. What am I saying, brothers and sisters? What I'm saying to you is this. All, not all fights are good. You fighting over uh, the, the fact that I got a better car than you. You fighting over, uh, you know, I remember growing up, we fight, Rick and I would sometimes fight over, no, that's my, I got the last piece of chicken. So, and so for those of you that uh, have engaged in fights, know what it's all about. But Paul ain't talking about carnal fights. Paul is talking about the good fight of faith. So having said that, a Christian has to be strong to fight the good fight of faith. A Christian has to be strong. Turn your Bibles to Ephesians chapter six. Ephesians six, our lesson text. We're gonna kind of cross reference as we go through. Ephesians chapter six, in verse 10, Paul says, finally, my brethren, be strong. You see this? In the Lord and in the power of his might. This spiritual strength, is found in the Lord. See, you can have all the power and might you want outside of Christ physically, but it's not going to do a thing against the devil. And I think someone put a politician's name on here. You can be as, you can act like you're all big and bad all you want. You are not God. I don't care if your last name is Nelson, Trump, Biden, I don't care, Obama, because no man, no woman, no king, no wannabe king, whatever quote unquote, Trump God, amen, saints. The strength that Paul is talking about is only found in the Lord. You cannot be strong spiritually outside of Christ. Uh, you, can be, you can lift weights. You can uh, have power and influence. You can even be president, but that won't make you a Christian. And it certainly does not make you spiritually strong. What did Paul say in Philippians chapter four and verse 13, a scripture that most Christians can quote? Paul says, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me or which strengtheneth me. 
Now, what's beautiful about that in the Greek, that word, through, those words through Christ in the original language, it, it's translated in Christ. Because you can't do anything through Christ unless you are in Christ. Amen, somebody. I miss y'all. That would have been an amen, I hope, in the auditorium. Let me say that again. Paul says, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me or which strengtheneth me in the King James Version. So the in Christ or through Christ is translated in the Koine Greek in Christ because you can't be through Christ unless you are in Christ. Amen. And like somebody being born into the Nelson family. And so now they can say, through my family, I do the following. So you can't be through unless you are in. Make sure you note that. Psalms 18th division in verse 39. The psalmist records first part of it. For thou hast girded me with strength unto the battle. Translate that into Hebrew. Thou hast, you have armed me for strength, with strength, excuse me, in the battle, unto the battle. So this battle, there is a fight. If any of you think tonight, as children of God, that we're not in a fight, you haven't been paying attention to God's word. Paul's letting, letting the saints know in Ephesians 6 and 10, be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. Our strength is rooted and grounded in the Lord. To our visiting friends, those outside the body of the church of Christ, my first encouragement to you, because of the fight, the fight is here and it's a spiritual battle. You got to be in Christ. It's not enough to just visit. It's not enough to profess Christ. You got to obey the gospel of Jesus Christ and you have to be in the Lord to fight the good fight, not some carnal man-made fight. The good fight is a spiritual battle. So as we think about the mindset of a child of God, I put it all on the screen for, for time's sake. Our mindset, point number two, if you will, we talked about Paul's uh, situational leadership. Despite the circumstances, he used what was around him for the glory of God. Paul recognized the reality of the battle. Look at verse 12 of Ephesians chapter 6, verse 11 rather, where Paul says, put on the whole armor of God that ye may, that ye may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. We're going to talk about wiles in a minute. So a Christian must decide. God does not force us to stand. We get into Christ. We've obeyed the gospel. God doesn't force us to stand up. It's the beginning when you obey the gospel and you become a Christian. We have a personal responsibility to grow in spiritual strength. Have you ever met a child of God? Go to the chat. Have you ever met a Christian that wasn't mature? Let's see how long it's going to take you to put that. Just go yes or no. Have you ever met a Christian that wasn't mature? Go to the chat. Yes or no? Come on. For a few more seconds. People putting all kind of S's, like 10, 20 S's. Yes, I got you, Galaxy J7 Prime. So again, the point's clear. So just because you are a Christian does not mean you are mature. I have not seen a no yet. And so we got various ages and everything else. And everybody's saying, I absolutely have met a Christian. People still saying, yes, y'all can stop now. I get the point. Uh, but what's beautiful about that, and when I say beautiful, not that immaturity is beautiful, that we recognize that that brother needs to grow. That sister needs to grow. I need to grow. And so as a child of God, we are soldiers. What Paul is saying in verse 11 Put on the whole armor of God that ye may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. Not every child of God is standing up through our lifestyle. We have a personal responsibility to grow in spiritual strength. Please turn your Bibles very quickly. Second Peter chapter one. Second Peter chapter one. I want to encourage all of us to grow up, to mature, to develop. When you, my brother was in the military, my big bro Rick, and he had to go through basic training. He had to pass certain thresholds, milestones before they went to war. As Christians, we come up out of the water as a new babe in Christ. We got to grow up because the battle is real. The devil does not get this now. The devil does not want anybody outside the church. He already has them. So who is he coming after? You and me. Why? Because we don't belong to him anymore. Let me say that one more time. Everybody out there in the world seems so happy, and I'm here a Christian. Well, he's you halfway out. 
That's a terrible mindset. I've heard Christians say that. I was happier before I came. So now I got all these restrictions. Wow. What a mindset. What a weak mindset. I'm calling it what it is. Don't you look back like Lot's wife, like there's something better out there? Yeah, you had all this freedom because the devil's like, do what you like. The devil's like, have it your way. You're the boss, your body, your money. Don't let them people tell you only one church. Devil doesn't, devil already has people out there. And so 2 Peter 1, beginning at verse number three, very quickly, you've seen this before, uh, according as his divine power has given unto us all things that pertain unto life and godliness through the knowledge of him that hath called us to glory and virtue, whereby are given unto us exceeding great and precious promises that by these ye might be partakers of the divine nature, spiritual nature, having escaped the corruption, some of you said corruption in your chat, that is in the world through lust. We degenerate, we digress. The world will wear us down, not build us up. So what do we need to do, Peter? Verse five, and beside this, giving all diligence, be diligent about this. Don't be uh, half-stepping, or excuse me, slowful. <laughs> uh, add to your faith virtue, and to your virtue knowledge, and to knowledge temperance, and to temperance patience, and to patience godliness, and to godliness brotherly kindness, and to brotherly kindness charity or agape love, for if these things be in you, if these things be in you, they're not in every Christian. They make you that ye shall neither be barren, idle, nor unfruitful in the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. But he that lacketh these things is blind, spiritually impaired in terms of understanding, and cannot see afar off, and hath forgotten that he was purged from his old sins. Wherefore, the rather, brethren, for those of you that this is election season, as anybody, everybody knows, here's your scripture. I did this on purpose. Wherefore, the rather, brethren, give diligence to make your calling and election sure. For if you, if you do these things, ye shall never fall eternally. We can sin, but we will never be outside. We will never uh, miss out on the eternal home. For so, here is the proof, an entrance shall be ministered unto you abundantly into the everlasting kingdom of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. A lot of verses there, but I wanted to just give you that reference point. If these things be in you and abound, you then grow up. We have to feed on the word of God. Go to Hebrews 5, beginning at verse 12. Turn your Bibles, come on. I'll give you the rest on the screen, but I need you to do some work with me. Hebrews chapter 5, beginning at verse 12. We have to feast and feed on the word of God. That's how we grow. I could have given you 1 Peter 2 and 2, desire to sincere milk of the word that you may grow thereby. That's relevant and applicable. But in Hebrews 5, beginning at verse 12, the Bible says, for when ye were, for when for the time ye ought to be teachers, ye have need that one teach you again, which be the first principles of the oracles of God and are become such as have need of milk and not of strong meat. Have you ever seen a 45 year old man, a 50, 50 year old woman with a baby, with a pacifier and a bottle in their mouth, you'd say something's seriously wrong with that brother or sister. We should, when we should be on meat, we have too many that's still on Gerber's baby food or on milk. For every one that, use, that useth milk is unskillful in the word of righteousness, for he is a babe. But strong meat belongeth to th them that are of full age maturity even those who by reason of use, use it or lose it, have their senses exercised, translate that word preacher, trained to discern both good and evil. Trained to discern, see where I'm pointing, everybody look at me for a minute. Trained to discern both good and evil, Hebrews 5 and verse 14. What's your point? My point is this, as we prepare for battle, before I even think about going into the equipment, we got to get the mindset right. Have you ever seen somebody put on a uniform, whether it's at work, whether it's sports, or whether any kind of uniform, or militarily, and not be trained? As Christians, we don't, we don't put on certain clothing, we put on Christ, but we have to grow in the Christian graces. And so in Hebrews 5, the Bible is saying, if you train your mind and grow and feast on the word, you can discern truth from a lie. When somebody walks up to you and says, I don't believe in one church. I don't believe that uh, 
And we got to be baptized to be saved because my grandmama, 90 years old, and she was a Bible reading a woman. She goes in her closet to pray, and you're sitting there saying, uh huh, yeah, okay, you may be right. I've seen Christians almost acquiesce to false teaching. I'm not saying you got to pick a fight. I'm not saying that at all. Be tactful, be loving, be hospitable, but don't you ever agree with false teaching. And hopefully, prayerfully, all of us are trained well enough to know and to show, get those two words, to know and to show what somebody needs to do to be saved. If somebody asks you tonight, what must I do to be saved? Can you take them? Without any notes, just show them the scriptures. That's your challenge. That's your encouragement. If you just have a Bible in your hand with no notes, you ain't got to quote anything, but take them to scriptures to show them what they must do to be saved. Every Christian needs to be able to do that. Amen? Amen. Let's work. So we talked about Paul's situational leadership. We talked about the reality of the fight. We've now talked about the, the mindset of a child of God. God is not going to force you or me to stand up. Brothers and sisters, we got to stand up. There's brothers and sisters in Christ who've been in the Lord's church. I'm going back. Who've been in the Lord's church for some time and are sitting down. No longer working. No longer sharing the word. And if it takes people to almost twist your arm for you to, to at least be faithful, then you've digressed. And my prayer tonight through this lesson, series of lessons, this is part one, is that you recognize that we're, we're at war. And do you want to go to war with somebody who's ill-prepared? If there is an active shooter, God forbid, anywhere, do you want to be around the person that's going to yell out and just scream? I get the fear. I get the panic. But we have to be able to bridle ourselves to the point of not harming anyone else. And having said that, let's talk about what we got to put on. The armor, full word armament of a Christian soldier, that word panoply in Ephesians chapter 6 and verse number 11, the Bible says, put on the whole armor of God that ye may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. devil. So if you are with me tonight and you're following along, once I know that there's a battle, my mind has to be right, locked in, focused. And we are deliberately presenting a lot of lessons on mindset because too many Christians have just kind of gotten too anxious. Don't let anxiety take over your body, your mind. Stay focused on God. Put on the whole armor. The word is panoply. The word panoply means to have something complete. Uh, com it means the full array or complete. So Paul instructs the Christians at Ephesus and us today to put on the whole, not some armor, the whole armor of God. The whole armor comes from the Greek word from which we get panoply. We must dress ourselves fully. Panoply means the full array or complete collection. Let me pause now. So we think about uh, the verse of one of the songs of panoply, the panoply of God. As we stand uh, fully equipped with our mind locked in and focused on service to God, recognizing that we're fighting a good fight. Most recently, a civil rights leader died and he talked about getting good trouble. What he was saying is, you know, do some, fight for a righteous cause, you know, equal rights, uh, not having people disparaged based on the color of their skin. So he talked about good trouble. And people are quoting that all over the place. See it on social media everywhere. I want to get in good trouble. I'm going to stand up for what's right. Well, brothers and sisters, the, the best fight of all, fighting a good fight of faith, is standing up for God and teaching people the truth. But we must do that with them, not only the mindset, but the armament of a Christian soldier. In other words, we need to take on the, put on the full armor of God. Why do we need to do that? Well, the Bible lets us know that ye may be able, look at verse 11, top of your screen, that ye may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. The word wiles in the Greek, I put it there on the slide for your notes, schemes and devices of Satan. Now, let me just pause for a minute. Now, growing up, I, I saw you know, just hot sauce bottles. I you know I grew up in the hood. So every hot sauce bottle had the devil on it. And I'm thinking the devil had a pitchfork and horns. Now, let me just be clear. And don't ask me this question in the chat. Uh, what does the devil look like? 
Well, the, the Bible, the devil talks about he is diabolical. He is a liar. He can present himself in, a, in through philosophies and, and do, doctrines or teachings. He ain't going to come up to you in a pitchfork with some horns saying, how you doing? I'm the devil. You want to go to hell? That ain't, that's not it, folks. The schemes, the devices of Satan are manifold. And so I want you all to understand that the devil is a, he's a, he's deceitful. Appeared to Eve and said, thou shalt not surely die. One word. God said, you shall surely die. The devil said, you shall not surely die. You know, there's people on TV every day, politicians will look right in the screen and make and tell a, my grandma would say a bold faced lie with a straight face. Pandemic gonna be gone tomorrow. Well, tomorrow came, it's still here. But I want you all to understand, the devil is real. He is, he is deceitful, full of trickery, full of schemes, devices, and the devil recognizes the battle, do we? And so our mindset has to be, I need to be equipped, trained, I need to feed on the word because the devil may come to me through someone that's going to say something to me to influence me. I read something recently that broke my heart. A member of the Lord's church, unfaithful, talking about the church of Christ. And yes, but say the church of Christ got a place in heaven, but there's 12 gates to heaven. So everybody else can have a, you know, Baptist church. Everybody else can have a gate too. Let me say it as clearly as I can. Try not to preach. That's a bold faced lie. The God has not 12 gates to heaven for the different denominations. That's not Bible. Let me bring it down. I'm sorry, y'all. Bible class, I think I'm in the pulpit. I can't help myself. We need to be trained to recognize and to understand that the devil is a liar. He's cunning and sly. And what does he do? Turn your Bible to 2 Corinthians 2, verse 11. 2 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 11. I apologize, visitors. I got a little hype. Because when I just see falsehoods, it breaks my heart, especially coming from children of God. We can digress to the point there are some unfaithful Christians out there that are posting stuff, writing stuff down uh, as if they never knew God. Oh, yeah, this church will do, but any church will do. There's no Bible for that. And you know what? That's a devil at work. Second Corinthians chapter 2, verse 11. Second Corinthians chapter 2, and the verse is number 11. Second Corinthians, the second chapter, and verse number 11. The Bible says, lest Satan should get an advantage of us for we are not ignorant of his devices those that word devices there is talking about the traps he sets the devil wants you to start thinking well don't doesn't god love everybody yes he does did god create everybody yes he did so then how can the same god who created us philosophical here how can the same god who created you and me destroy us because he is just and biblically, because sin cannot, cannot coexist with God in heaven. So we have an opportunity to get it right. So God made it possible for everybody to be saved. That's why. And if man chooses to, to obey the gospel, he can be saved based on God's justice. But God's justice will not allow you or me to be with, with God in heaven if we sin, if we, go, if we die uh, outside of Christ, or if we die in Christ and we're unfaithful. So our greatest adversary is the devil. He wants us, to, he wants us, he wants to take us to, with him to hell. Gehenna, eternal fire, eternal damnation, reserved for the devil and all of his messengers. So devil lays traps for us. So just like walking through a landmine, you better know where you're walking and know who you're walking with and be trained for battle. So let me go ahead and give you a quiz question very quickly. Uh, open book. What does panoply mean? Go to the chat. What does panoply mean? What does panoply mean? Go to the chat. Make sure y'all with me. I got a few more slides. What does panoply mean? I want to see, once I see a few, a pattern of answers, I know we're good. What does panoply mean? Nice, Rosalind. Good, G2. Good, Lisa. Now y'all got it. Yes, very good. Very good. Good job. Now, together, Andrea, together, I mean, everything. Just make sure it's complete, full array. Very good. I like that. Let's hasten on. So here's the, the, what's the battle? We talked about the mindset. We talked about the reality of the good fight. 
we talked about the fact that God wants us to be strong. We're only strong in Christ and therefore through Christ. But the battle itself, this warfare, is not a physical one. Ephesians. Let me go back over there. Ephesians chapter 6. That's why it has to be two-part lesson. I need to get you ready for where we're going next with the equipment. Ephesians chapter 6 and verse 12. I'll read it for you. For we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. This warfare, this battle is not a physical one with physical weapons, but rather spiritual. And like I mentioned, uh, and again, I don't want anybody to, because uh, some people can physically fight, they're too good at it, and some people can't fight at all. I'm thankful to God this is not a physical battle. This is a spiritual battle. 2 Corinthians chapter 10, verses 3 through 5. I'll turn over there if you can. Turn with me. 2 Corinthians chapter 10, beginning at verse 3. I want you to understand what Paul had to say to the saints. For though we walk in the flesh, we do not war after the flesh. For the weapons of our warfare are not carnal. This ain't about put up your dukes and let me grab something and hit you with it. No, but mighty through God to the pulling down of strongholds, casting down imaginations and every high thing that exalteth itself against the knowledge of God and bringing into captivity every thought to the obedience of Christ. So this battle, this spir uh, it's spiritual in nature, nature. So our enemies are spiritual. Satan is behind all evil. The list includes, this is not exhaustive, evil rulers throughout the world. Some people stand against God. We'll tell you, they're atheists. Wicked people have great influence, ungodly causes, philosophies. Some philo And so again, don't ever get too smart, too smart for God. I would tell you all many times when I was little, when I started correcting my mama, uh, and because she, the way she was speaking or something like that. Well, I got, I was quickly redirected. I'll just leave it there. But my point is, uh, make sure when people come to you with foolishness, don't don't give don't give heed to it. Ungodly causes, philosophies, atheism, secular humanism. Basically, there's no truth. Modernism. We need a new and improved way to serve God. And denominationalism. Saints of God, hear me clearly. I wonder, I pray that there's no child of God who thinks in their heart that you can be saved outside the body of the Church of Christ. And there are Christians who think that or just tolerate that. Well, maybe, just maybe. Well, brothers and sisters, if you don't see that in this Bible, don't give heed to that. You got to stand up. I've had people ask. I've seen it in writing. Why do we always talk about one church? In a church survey, why do we always talk about one church? Because there's only one. And we want it, and God wants everybody to be saved. And guess what? I've heard saints say, in meetings, uh, both not only in Miami Gardens, but elsewhere as well. Do we have to call every, the names, Baptist, Methodist? Because I got family here today. I don't want anybody to get offended. They need to hear exactly what the Bible says. And guess what? If they're offended, ask the question. We got to stand up in battle. We got too many that are kind of just, let's just be silent and not say anything because we don't want to offend anybody. You got to stand up. Amen, saints. Let me finish it. Practical application. Preview of coming attractions. The Roman soldier. Put on the whole armor of God, the Bible says. That you, we're going to talk about the helmet of salvation, the breastplate of righteousness, the belt of truth, sword of the spirit, shield of faith, and the feet protected by the gospel. Not in that particular order. We're going to follow the scriptures. But here's my question. This is a, this is a uh, softball. It is easy. Which piece of equipment is the most important? Go to the chat. Which piece of equipment is the most important? Go ahead and put it on there. I've already set you up for this. Which piece of equipment is the, mo is the most important? Come on. I love it. Oh, Tony Little said the sword. One okay. Uh-oh. Word of God. Okay. Huh. Oh, shield of faith is the most important. Y'all, I'm set y'all up. Uh, some of y'all got it. Shield of faith. Okay. All right. Galaxy Tab A. I see you all. Uh, well, brothers and sisters, uh, some of y'all didn't pass the quiz because the entire armament is to be taken. Here's the reference point. And you can't see if you got the sword, the truth, you know, every, every piece of the Roman equipment, and we're going to show, we're going to break this down uh, as we go into part two. 
but you have to understand that every piece of equipment, the whole armor of God, the panoply, one is not more important than the other. They all work together. There's, and again, if I were to go back, let me just give you a quick, uh, quick snapshot. The belt of truth, that belt holds everything together. When you go to war with just the belt on, you got a lot of problems. If you go with just a shield, uh, you got a defense, but you have no offense. Uh, the breastplate, you go without that breastplate of righteousness, that protected all the vital organs, if you will. So we're going to, I would then, I would take every piece of equipment and then guess what? It's all important. Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. So that was a setup question. So wearing only part of the armor will leave us unprotected and vulnerable. The whole armor is needed to withstand in the evil day. The evil day is any occasion. But is there a big day called the evil day? That could be tomorrow. It could be today when you face a trial, a temptation, or you, any kind of trouble where we are in danger. So the image, the image described as one of a soldier having withstood all assaults, all kinds of danger of the enemy, and at the end of the battle, he's still standing. Y'all hear, hear me? At the end of the battle, he's still standing. We need, to, we need the courage and conviction of David when he faced the giant Goliath. Who is this uncircumcised Philistine that he will withstand, withstand the armies of God? We need the conviction of 1 John 4 and 4. Greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world, having done all to stand. And in part two of this lesson, we're gonna break down each piece of equipment and its importance because I want you all to understand that every, the full armor, the whole armor, the panoply is important. God has a plan for man. The gospel that must be obeyed is the starting point. The starting point, you must, the gospel is the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. You must hear and believe the gospel, Act 15 and 7. You must repent of your sins, Luke 13, 3 and 5. Jesus Christ said, I tell you nay, but except you repent, you shall all likewise perish. You must confess Christ with your mouth to be the son of God, Acts 8 and verse 37. Upon that confession, you, you are washed, you are immersed fully, fully immersed, not sprinkled, not poured in water for the remission of your sins. Your sins are washed away, Acts 22 and verse 16. And last, you stand up to walk, to live in a brand new way of life with the full armor of God on, being faithful unto death. And God has promised us a crown of life. That completes part one, the armor of God. We're thankful to God for that we've had this opportunity to discuss the word of God. We hope, trust, and pray uh, that everyone has uh, been able to follow. I don't know if Brother Rick, I know he was getting back in town today. Brother Rick, are you with us tonight? Engineers, talk to me. Is Big Bro on? Big Bro left Little Bro all by himself. Well, all right. We, we're we're, we're going to handle it. So let me ask you all this. If there's some questions, go ahead and put it in the chat. Uh, we'll get an opportunity to address a few questions. Or if there's any comments, certainly uh, we want to uh, address that. <laughs> I just saw your note, Tyrone. Sometimes traps are set through the teacher. Now, that's just a teaching strategy, a methodology uh, that uh, to make sure that everybody's following me. So I hope, it, let me ask you all this question. Thank you, Tyrone. Is everybody clear that the full panoply, that's kind of a double, uh, the panoply, which means full. Uh, is everybody clear that the panoply of God, the whole armor, we need all of it. Amen. Just put amen or yes in the chat. All right, Lewis family. All right, good. Very important. So some of y'all saying it's the sword. It's the, it's the shield. Yeah, those are all important, but I said the most important. It's kind of like a, a ACT, SAT question setting you up. So I did it on purpose. Amen. I'm glad you all got that. I'll give it a few minutes. If anybody have any comments or questions, uh, what, let me just ask you this then. Uh, what encouraged you the most tonight? Soldiers of Christ arise. That's it, brother. What encouraged you the most tonight? Let's just spend a few, few minutes on this. What encouraged you the most tonight? Or what'd you learn? Tell me what, tell me what to encourage you. And then we're gonna go ahead. Be strong in the Lord. Amen. Amen, Tony. I like that little bro. Rest not against flesh and blood. Lewis family, you're right. Uh, so don't spend your time just battling with people. I'm sorry. Seek to resolve it. And you know what? Take the loss. Sometimes you just take the loss and move on. Don't lose your soul over somebody else. Please. We got people that will spend so much energy just fighting. It ain't worth it. Move on. And that takes some maturity. Sister Rosalind, thank you. A mindset on God. 
I was in a training recently, Sister Rosalind, and the trainer said, zip it, lock it, put it in your pocket. I like that. Zip it. They called the no, zip it, lock it, put it in your pocket. Just in other words, if you ain't got something good to say, zip it, lock it, and put it in your pocket and move on. So y'all can use that. Teachers use that tomorrow in school with these kids. Andrea, no matter what is going on, your faith outweighs the haters. Amen. NC2, Paul uses environment to encourage the saints. Yes, sir. Yes, sir, my dear brother. Uh, we, we, uh, brother Cole. I'm sorry, I couldn't help myself. That's French. Uh, thank you, mama. Thank you, mama bear. Uh, <laughs> he uses environment to encourage the saints. So no matter what your environment, he was in prison. No matter what your environment, uh, don't complain about it. Don't pray for God to take you out of it. Lord, use me. Lord, use me where I am. And that can go ahead and get you going. Thank you, Leonard Stevens. Whole armor is important. Amen. Amen. What was the scripture again for God loves everyone? Because I hear people keep using that saying for God loves everybody. Uh, God so loved the world. John 3, 16. Uh, that's see what you quoted there when people say, well, God love everybody. You take them to John 3, 16, Beverly, for God so loved the world. I think that's everybody. Uh, that he gave his only begotten son. So a good way to uh, use that, Beverly, is will God love the world, but love prompted action. And if you love God, why not obey him? See, so many here to, to learn is encouraging. Thank you, Sister Ferdinand. Learned about the armor. Thank you, Sister Rosalind. Our time is up at 747. I thank you all for, the, for just having a little chat with me tonight. We have to remember that God has us in his hand. Yes, right. We'll get to the prayer request in just a minute. Is Brother Lindsay with us tonight? Give Brother Lindsay an opportunity. Brother Lindsay with us, engineers. Brother Lindsay, let's, Brother Lindsay, come on in, brother. Any comments, closing comments or thoughts? Hello. Hey, my brother. There we go, Lindsay. Man, that was a good lesson, my brother. Man, it wore me out, man. I'm tired. I'm going to have Hogan preach. Yeah, I hear you, brother. I'll be chewing on that lesson all night. Woo, that's all Amen. right, man. Thank you, Lindsay. Thank you, brother. Was it clear, Lindsay? Don't leave me, Lindsay. Say it again. Was it clear? Say it again. Was it clear? Was, was it clear? Lesson, was a lesson clear? It certainly was. Amen, brother. All right, then. It certainly was, my brother. Do you have any announcements at all for the, for the flock? Uh, no, I don't have any announcements. All right, my dear brother. Thank you, Lindsay. Uh, engineers, if we could put up the announcements very quickly. Uh, seeing Brother Aldridge smiling like that, I love it, brother. I love it. 